musical linguistic arches. <laughs> Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And I have to tell you that as I was getting ready to record this podcast just now, I felt like maybe I was Rip Van Winkle or somebody just waking up from a long sleep and discovering that a lot of time has passed without me noticing. What I'm talking about is that for the past 10 days, I've more or less ignored the world while I'm in the final stages of recording my audio book. And when I poked my head back up and checked my email, I discovered that so many donors had made contributions to the salon that I was sure it must be December already and that it was Christmas time. Wait till you hear this list of donors. And they are... John A., our old friend, a dime short. Thanks again, Michael. Jason H., SMD Books, who uh, I notice happens to be located in Paris... So you Parisian saloners now know uh, where to find a few of the others. And we also received another donation from my fellow grandfather, Robert O. And uh, thank you again for your longtime support, Robert. And we also received three generous donations, one from Jarrett S., one from someone who would rather remain completely anonymous, so thank you, Anon. And the third one came from Wiley L., who is a longtime friend that... I haven't seen since we were last together in Palenque. Wow, you guys have all really outdone yourselves this time. I simply don't know what to say. And I'd also like to thank Steve and Julie and you other wonderful saloners for your cool cards and notes. I wish there was time to send out personal thank yous to everyone who sends in a donation or a card or email... But I do want you to know that everything any of our saloners do to help spread the word about the psychedelic community is greatly appreciated by me and by all of our fellow psychonauts around the world. It's a wonderful community that we are all a part of. So, now that we've found some of the others, uh, let's get to work here and get on with the program. At the end of today's podcast, I'll give you an update on the archival preservation work that is being done for the Shulgin and Stolarov papers, and there is a lot of good news on that front. So, in the spirit of preserving archival material, I thought it might be appropriate once again to dip into the Timothy Leary archives and pull out another one of his pioneering talks. What I'm going to play for us to hear right now is an interview that Dr. Leary gave in 1983. And this is from a cassette tape in his archive that was labeled New Dimensions, featuring Tim Leary, recorded in 1983. And thanks to Bruce Damer and Dennis Berry, the woman who is responsible for this huge archive, all of the audio and video recordings that Timothy saved are being digitized and released to the Internet via the Internet Archive, which you can find at archive.org, and through these podcasts here in the Psychedelic Salon. Now, you're going to find this interview a little different in that it begins more like what our young saloners would call a history lesson and what grandpas like Robert O. and I think of uh, more as a stroll down memory lane. But I think that these stories are very important right now because we are entering another period of great instability, not unlike the 60s, I might add. And so if we know what some people did in the past at another time of great cultural upheaval, If we know what worked and what didn't work, well, then it seems to me that we have an excellent chance of ratcheting our species up yet another notch on our evolutionary climb out of the swamp. At least that's my rationale for indulging myself by playing what I think is a really interesting interview. And now, here is Dr. Timothy Leary back in 1983, when the Big news was that Lotus 123 had just been ported to the then new IBM PC, and Ronald Reagan had just begun his horrible reign. And it was about 10 years before we had the World Wide Web. You remember those times, don't you? I, I think they were called the Dark Ages. I'd like to enter a time machine, uh, if we will, uh, and go back 20 years, go back to Harvard. And uh, if you can put yourself back in that place, I'm wondering at that time, what was your vision of the future? What did you see, what you were doing then? Did you see it taking 
where did you see it going? What was your future uh, idea of its direction, the work you were doing? I think that uh, from the very, very beginning of our psychedelic drug research at Harvard, we knew that uh, we were on the verge of something very big. We knew that uh, human intelligence and human virtue had reached a point where uh, we would be able to uh, learn more about the brain and activate it. Um, the, uh, of course, those of us at Harvard, uh, Richard Alpert, Bob Ramdas, uh, Ralph Metzner, the, the large group that assembled there, were not the pioneers, the, uh, the, the people that were teaching us about consciousness, expanding drugs, were people like Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, even uh, Henry Luce, the respectable conservative uh, founder of Time magazine. There was a, a large group of uh, thoughtful people who told us that uh, the doors of perception were going to open and an avalanche of uh, change would happen. So we, there was never any doubt in our minds that uh, we, we were mem members of, a, of an old profession. And this happened before. It happened in the uh, 1830s. There was a transcendental movement, which again started at Harvard. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, the first great uh, uh, woman uh, transcendentalist. That explosive uh, movement in, of, of uh, Brook Farm, uh, but of course it goes way back. Uh, if you want to take the time tunnel, uh, the the concepts that we were working with, which is altered states, uh, consciousness expansion, increased intelligence, uh, finding divinity, and finding illumination, revelation within, it, it goes back uh, throughout human history. So we were, with the aid of people like Alan Watson and Aldous Huxley, we were we were pretty clear that we were uh, and certain that we were. Uh, riding a Niagara wave. Well, what happened with respect to the institution uh, in the sense, I mean, did you become too successful and suddenly it wasn't appropriate to to be a part of the institution anymore? Or did you, or was it a, somehow somehow become threatening all of a sudden? What, what took place there when uh, Harvard essentially uh, asked you to leave and you departed? It, it became clear to us that uh, the sort of research we were doing which involved uh, radically different ways of approaching the brain and the mind uh, couldn't and shouldn't be done in a prestigious, respectable, highly um, uh, establishment organization like Harvard University. So uh, actually uh, several weeks before uh, Richard and I were fired, I had left Harvard. I turned in my... Uh, my uh, time clock and uh, had, had headed for uh, Mexico where we'd started uh, a training center. We knew that we shouldn't be at Harvard and we had no, uh, and never have had any uh, grudges about Harvard. Goodness, uh, Harvard is there to uh, train Ivy Leaguers to go to Washington and Wall Street and, <laughs> and keep the WASP establishment going. They're supposed to be turning out new Buddhas and <laughs> a new brand of science fiction uh, neuronauts. <laughs> So it was just sort of a natural thing. Yes, we, uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was a little drama involved in it. Uh, as I, in flashbacks, I mentioned some of the um, minor political squabbling. There was a, a professor there named Herbert Kelman who kind of led an attack on us and uh, turned out later that he was uh, a beneficiary of CIA funding. He says he wasn't winning, but that doesn't make any difference. The CIA knew they had a good, sound fellow there that uh, should be rewarded. So that uh, there were, but there were th political issues, uh, but they're secondary. They're kind of uh, gossipy, but they're real. we didn't belong at Harvard, and uh, we uh, we set up our own institutions. That uh, throughout history, that's been true. You know, Freud couldn't get uh, a job in a Viennese hospital, and. Uh, Socrates got uh, <laughs> put in the, put in the last cell in the back row and uh, of death row, and uh, Voltaire had to head it on the lamb. Uh, the long we were pretty much aware. Uh, I think all of us uh, at the Harvard psychological group, and, and that included about thirty-five of us, uh, people like Professor Walter Clark, who was a very distinguished, gray, ultra respectable uh, theologian. The younger uh, psychologists do. They knew they were risking their careers. They knew that they were uh, maybe 
going to put themselves out a little too far and never able to get back. But uh, they, we had a, we, we always had a sense of history. Allen Ginsberg, I, I have a chapter in flashbacks about Allen Ginsberg coming to Harvard. And Allen and uh, people like Kerouac and Burroughs taught us a great deal, too. They had the street wisdom that we lacked, uh, being Ivy League Harvard professors. And Allen Ginsberg, uh, whatever you think of his poetry, is a very effective um, literary social worker. He's like a, 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 a cosmic defense attorney for uh, beatniks and romantics and uh, bohemians and hippies and hipsters, no matter what name you give them. The, uh, the, the group in every culture throughout history that have carried on the message of individuality, look within, irreverence to authority, question authority, uh, try something new. Ginsburg was uh, very aware. Ginsburg told me, and I, I've, I've thought about it almost every week since then, that uh, we were part of the of the Bohemian tradition or of the avant-garde tradition that uh, had always existed. And he, he felt that uh, our group included Gary Snyder, it included uh, Ken Kesey. He saw us as, as as important historically as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Uh, and uh, we're a young country, and you, we've only been going 200 years. And I think when the history of our times is written, you're you're never going to hear the names of Nixon or Kissinger or MacArthur. Or, you know, the, you may make some mention of Roosevelt, maybe Kennedy, because of the of the assassination of the romance. But the uh, Allen told us, and, and I believe him, and I'll repeat it today, that I think that the history of America is going to be the history of people like Emerson, uh, Thoreau, uh, Jefferson as a philosopher. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, my God, that poor man was, you know, was uh, savaged by the media and uh, pushed around by the establishment. Uh, Mark Twain, who was a tremendous outcast, even though he was very popular. The history of America is the history of those of us that belong to this this, uh, wonderful brotherhood and sisterhood of uh, avant-garde inner voyagers that we we believe uh, that we're the American tradition. And uh, so we weren't really that surprised when the, the thing exploded in the 60s. We, we, that's what we had signed up for. I recall something in the book you mentioned about Aldous Huxley, and I believe there was somebody else whose name I can't recall, and Aldous was saying that uh, he thought you were a little too conservative uh, in your approach. <laughs> yes, that uh, uh, Humphrey Osmond. That's the, it, Humphrey the, Osmond. The brilliant yeah. uh, British psychiatrist who invented the word psychedelic had been conspiring with uh, Huxley, and the two of them came to Harvard, and they kind of checked me out, and uh, they they were hoping that we would do pretty much what we did. But I think we probably carried a little too far, or, or events carried all of us farther than we expected, but uh, Huxley uh, and Osmond, after the dinner with me, went, well, he's a nice guy, but he's a little too straight, and uh, maybe we can loosen him up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you mentioned Allen Ginsberg. He had this idea of uh, traipsing off to New York on weekends and turning on uh, as many of uh, his associates and friends as possible. And there were some fascinating stories that you were related in the book about those kind of those experiences. Well, as I say, Alan has always been a, pol- a politician, a cosmic politician. He was the first person to point out to me the uh, insanity and cruelty of the drug laws of treating uh, people as criminals for uh, trying to alter their conscience. He was a a tremendous crusader and always has been anytime anyone was in jail God knows how many times Alan bailed me out or got uh, signatures and petitions to help me out of the various uh, dungeons that the uh, establishment put me in so uh, Alan uh, said that our strategy should be uh, one of uh, turning on important people in uh, literature and poetry art uh, music so uh, he had I remember it was about 21 years ago today in my uh, dining room he pulled out his battered leather uh, address book and there in his tiny little Ginsburg scrawl he had the names and addresses and phone numbers of the who's who of American art uh, and then he'd give me a ring and uh, uh, in the middle of the week and I'd go down <laughs> Uh, from Logan Airport on the Boston to the New York shuttle with uh, my little bag full of psilocybin pills. And Peter Luskin, Alan, and I would uh, go around uh, uh, New York uh, turning on uh, the famous, distinguished, uh, successful uh, people in the arts. The, The idea was that if we turned them on, they could tell us what they experienced because we were novices. They could, in turn, uh, uh, teach other people uh, about this, and uh, we thought that um, the um, the movement would grow that way, and certainly did. 
Timothy, if you were back in the 60s now, would you do anything differently than you did then? Oh, Michael, it's, uh, that's, of course, the big if question. Wouldn't we all do it differently if we could do it? You know, if you go back to your senior prom, it would, uh, um, I've, I've given this a great deal of thought, and I've been asked that question many times. Uh, basically, we were out there doing our best uh, on a frontier that had never been explored before. Our, our hearts were pure, and we, uh, we, the, I think we, on the big issues, um, we always did the right thing. One thing I kind of regret is that uh, we were a little blind. I didn't understand the importance of the new generation. I didn't realize demography that there were 76 million kids born between the years 46, that's post Hiroshima, and 1964, double the birth rate. 40 million more than we expected. Now, the impact uh, of doubling a birth rate in a country like America is, is simply enormous. And, of course, this generation was not only different in size, it was different uh, in their basic reality imprints. As parents of this generation, we, you know, it was Dr. Spock, it was demand feeding, it was treat them equals, treat them as individuals, don't force them into... That had never been done before to kids. That's almost unheard of. And when the right-wing reactionary and left-wing reactionary people uh, later on blamed Dr. Spock, you know, of some, they were right. Uh, it was, of course, Dr. Spock was simply a, a vehicle, a, a, an instrument for genetic history unfolding. But this, we, we hot shots at Harvard and we philosophy PhDs really didn't understand that this generation was going to sweep through American culture like a, a tsunami wave, changing everything, including us, and it just swept us right out of Harvard and it swept us right out of any illusions we might have had of slow change. Uh, I, I think that uh, if we caught on to this quicker, uh, we probably would have warned people in the late 60s that the LSD they were getting was not pure and that there was a deliberate government conspiracy to kind of uh, you know, um, cloud up uh, and and put out really dangerous drugs. I think that we we uh, we, we didn't understand the enormity of implications of the baby boom. And um, I, I personally now feel that uh, the concept of generation, the generation you belong to, uh, is one of the most important things in your life because you're going to be swimming like a school of fish in this school of your own generation. And the kids that came up in the in the 60s, hit high school and college in the 60s and early 70s, share basic reality imprints that uh, are entirely different from Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and, and even Teddy Kennedy. And uh, the uh, the reason that the importance of, of generation, generational demographics, demora demora generational psychology... Uh, we didn't, we didn't understand it was because there had never in history been such a quick generational change of that import and that numbers uh, of the baby womb. So in hindsight, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have done something differently, but, but you can't... Uh, what about your uh, perception of the establishment? I mean, in some sense, in talking about being out on the edge, you were out on the farthest edge. And have you ever thought that perhaps you took the rap for a lot of other people? Since, I mean, you got nailed and many other people didn't. Well, I, I was very aware of that, and I think um, most thoughtful people were aware of that. In the uh, After uh, Nixon came into power in 1968, uh, it's obvious he couldn't do anything about young people and the counterculture and drugs, but one thing he could do would be, and he said it uh, in so many words, we can imprison the spokesman. So I knew that uh, I was a uh, like a lightning rod. I knew that I was uh, like a symbol. And uh, I accepted this. Uh, it's reality, and uh, you can't complain about it, or you can't uh, cry foul. That's the way the ball game is played, and uh, that's why I've never felt any resentment or bitterness. As a matter of fact, I'm rather honored. Uh, you know, I was put in the penalty box for, in the great cosmic hockey game for four <laughs> years. Well, the, the, they they put in the penalty box the people they think are mo most dangerous to them, and in a sense, that it's flattering. So. Uh, um, do you think, in, in, in reflecting on that experience, that, that the establishment learned anything from their experience with you? And if so, what? No, the establishment never learns anything. Uh, they'd start, well, they'd start Vietnam again, uh, as they're trying to do in Central America. 
Vietnam was, of course, the Korean War. <laughs> they, they, they never learned anything. They were always fighting the, the last war because you can't learn. Uh, you, once you've been imprinted in, 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 um, in adolescence, unless you deliberately try to uh, re-imprint and change, you, you can't learn. You're simply going to repeat the same uh, reactions because you're living in the same reality. Um uh, Tip O'Neill and, and Ronald Reagan's uh, 60s was Teddy Roosevelt running around storming Cuba and running down with a big stick in the Caribbean and shaking his fist at Nicaragua and stealing the Panama Canal away from from the country of Colombia. So that, uh, no, they, they, they still see the world in those terms and uh, they... Uh, they can't be expected to to change, and, and I'm not being uh, I'm not being hostile here. It's a straight neurological fact we're talking about. What allows some people to re-imprint and change, and others not? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, where you hang out uh, is very important. Uh, I think the people that you associate with. The problem with with uh, Ronald Reagan right now is that he probably spends less than 2 or 3% of his time with uh, kids under the age of uh, 18. He simply never hangs out with them. And if he does, there's not any sense of learning from them, you know, to perform. So I'd say really zero. He's getting no input from, uh, from the whiz kids. I think he spends almost no time with baby boomers, those now between the age of 18 and 36. He may see them occasionally, but it's to give a speech at, a, you know, a, uh, at an organization. But to really sit down, hang out, listen, absorb, learn, exchange, interface, uh, you know, get it on with, and that the only way you can learn, these people don't, uh, and they get trapped in their, um, their realities, and, uh, of course, it's true, the Soviet people that run the Soviet Union and China, too, look at their faces, they, uh, uh, it's so simple, too, if you want to change, uh, it's just, uh, it's geography, just, just move to the place where, uh, different people hang out and listen and uh, uh, right now I spend um, I spend about uh, oh 60 percent of my time with with people between the ages of 18 and 36 my wife comes from this group and most of our friends are I spend about 20 percent maybe 25 percent of my time with uh, kids born after 64 this is my nine-year-old son my 10-year-old granddaughter my 11-year-old grandson I hang out you know listening to them playing computers with them and uh, I spend less than 10% of my time with people um, of my own generation. Uh, I can play. I, I see uh, very clearly that the age of the people you hang out with determines your age. And it's possible just as we, you have geographical units like uh, continents like Asia and Africa and Ireland, generations are, 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 ge are temporal units. And you can jump generations. You can migrate. And how do you migrate from one generation to another? It's, it's time travel. Just hang out uh, with people of different ages. And, and I like to take trips way back to uh, way back to the 1920s. Uh, I can talk World War II. I can talk alcohol prohibition with the old timers, and I love to do it. But not more than 10 percent of the time. You know, we we heard about the the uh, 60s being the. Um Revolutionary generation, the revolutionary decade, and the '70s being the me decade. And what do you think is the legacy of the '60s? Because most of that really is media hype. I mean, it's really not an accurate reflection of what happened. Well, I think it's a um, it's a mistake to focus on the uh, the the decade. You must keep your eye on that generation, the baby boom generation, those born between the years 1946 and 64. The late 60s and early 70s was their adolescence. So it was romantic, idealistic. Uh, they wanted to shake up and change sexual mores, music, art, uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, you name it. Uh, anything in the broad spectrum of American culture was changed by these kids then. Now, the 70s was a period when they were settling down into graduate school. They were getting, or they were settling down to careers. They were having families. Uh, the 80s, uh, or the uh, uh, period when this group is getting to a position where they're going to take over. You see, in 1988, there'll be an election then, I hope. The baby boomers, 76 million of them, will be between the ages of 24 and 42. 
So we're talking here about this generation is basically a 21st century generation. And instead of using the term baby boom, I sometimes prefer to use the concept the 21st century generation because at the turn of the century, the baby boomers are between the ages of uh, 36 and 54. They'll have the, it's their generation, it's, it's their, this their century. They're not really of this century. So they're going to, in the future, step by step, they're going to take over. And I tell you, they are different, and they're going to make uh, America a different uh, and a much better country. Do you think uh, psychedelics are necessary for change, for people to change, to re-imprint, as it were? Yes, I, I, I think that uh, now, this period, um, I, I would be amazed if anyone would explain to me how they can really change the neurological imprint without uh, using uh, you know, the, the organic chemicals that are... See, a drug that changes your brain is an access code, like the, that, those circuits of your computer. They, uh, drugs inter, interface or interconnect or, or unlock uh, receptor sites in the brain. Now, there are, there are other ways of doing this. Uh, uh, Dr. Patterson apparently has developed this electrical way of setting up vibrations to, uh, to uh, set off endorphins and so forth. I'm sure that in the future we will, we will uh, have uh, other ways of doing this the, uh, well, the Buddhists would say they have other ways of doing it, for example. Good for them, good for them. Yeah. Uh, there's no, um, there's um, really no cause for debate here. Uh, anyone who really, uh, if you think of the endpoints that you want to get to, and then anything that will get you there, is, 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 it's your style and your way of doing it. Uh, In some sense, if one looks at other cultures and other societies, uh, particularly um, more societies that would fit the definition of primitive, primitive um, or perhaps using the word primal um, and not using primitive in the sense that it's ordinarily used as being backwards or not uh, civilized or whatever. But if one looks at primitive societies, one notices that frequently they have ritualized uh, events in their lives where they use um, natural drugs to uh, change their consciousness in order to deal with various aspects of their life and in this society we don't seem to have any such ritual other than perhaps the stand-up cocktail party and not much more than that well it is interesting how alcohol has got so much ritual you know you walk into a bar room at five o'clock or six o'clock in the afternoon it's like a, a cathedral with the glass and the bottles and the lights and the the priest is the bartender's white uniform and the clinks and the and the laughter and the 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 merriment of people who've just gotten off work and want to flirt or want to relax. It's a incredibly powerful ritual that has nothing to do with alcohol. But one, one, I hesitated when you asked me about, oh, did I think drugs were necessary and kind of pause for for this reason. You you have to ask about. Any consciousness altering technique, what's the goal? Instead of talking about this form of meditation or that, uh, this drug or that, what are you, what are you trying to get? Uh, what is the, the end state? Because after all, it's not the drug or the technique, although we quarrel and imprison each other and uh, divide up and, and debate over the, the technique issue, the, the, the basic issue is where do we want to get? And I don't think we can discuss consciousness or drugs uh, at this moment in world history without realizing that we are changing from an industrial society to an information society and uh, the awesome implications of this and obviously uh, the, the use of drugs the fact that um, you know, in America today 90 billion dollars is spent on, on illegal drugs alone 90 billion dollars that's, that's like 20 times more than the entire output of Hollywood in a year uh, uh, and that's just illegal drugs. That doesn't include uh, the, the, the legal drugs like alcohol and nicotine and uh, and prescription drugs. Uh, it's a, the reason for this is not that society is going to hell or that it's for the Roman Empire. It's we're moving into an information society when a communication and when neurological uh, uh, input-output and expansion of, uh, of receptors and in, uh, better techniques of 
of storing and transmitting information. The, the, these are the, uh, the the real issues. And naturally, uh, drugs which alter consciousness, which which uh, change your processing of information, are going to be more part of life uh, than in a uh, in industrial in an industrial society. You couldn't possibly have a big drug movement which involved individual search or individual uh, personal development. Why? Because everyone had to be there at the factory at 8 o'clock when that whistle went off and you had to work right on your job until 5 and you had to punch that clock and you had to be dependable, reliable, replaceable, conforming. Now, you, you couldn't have a, a personal growth, internal introspection, meditation, psychedelic uh, type movement in, a, in an industrial society. So the, what we call the 60s and the me generation, uh, the self-development, personal growth movement of the of the 70s, and the, and the to me the, the 80s are kind of like the the really hip, sophisticated hipster generation. I think I do a lot of lecturing, uh, Michael, at colleges, and I talk, you know, to young people. I listen to them. And they're not conservative. Uh, they're, they're basically realistic. I think they're very sophisticated, and I think they, they, they understand the 60s, they understand the 70s, and they're not uh, waving flags, but I think that they're basically, uh, you know, they've got a certain um, uh, cynical, tolerant, amused wisdom here that, uh, that uh, I think is going to be... Um, quite appropriate for the information society that we're generating. And I must say at this point that the, the use of, of brain change drugs or of conscious altering techniques has got to be uh, tied in to the use of computers. I've been working with, with and around computers and computer people for the last uh, two years. And uh, I'm, I'm not the first person to say this. It's almost a cliche, but computers are the 80s. What uh, brain change drugs were the 60s and early 70s. They And you know, you talk to people and they say, well, I use a computer to because it saves time or because it's more efficient. That's not the issue. A computer is a, an ex extension of the human brain, and you can program computers. I'm, I'm working now with a group uh, that are programming computers to, to think like selves. So, the, so that you'd have a program which would have a personality, and uh, we're, tr we're trying to program computers to evolve and to, to grow. And if we can train a computer to do that, then, of course, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, a lot more respectable and a lot easier for the whole society to uh, accept these concepts of, uh, of personal growth and uh, development. And program and computers so that we don't need ourselves anymore. That's the question. See, the use of uh, humanots, that's uh, advanced com artificial intelligence computers and robots, raises the question, you know, we don't need human beings to work anymore. As a matter of fact, work is a should be stricken from our vocabulary in a sense work is slavery work is something that you have to do now any work that you have to do that can be done better by a machine of course is humiliating but the question is if computers and robots can help us evolve and grow what do we need what are humans for isn't that wonderful finally we're not here to to uh, to fight communism we're not here to 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 fight for a job we don't do that anymore what are we for well the answer to that is the function of the human being is to evolve, to grow, to become more intelligent, to uh, to become uh, a, uh, a more advanced uh, form of, uh, of our species. And it's exactly that moment when, when computers and robots are teaching us, are acting as catalysts to uh, to uh, to stimulate us to uh, make the next evolutionary move. It's, it's, uh, I go around now and I watch everything's being done by human beings. Could this be done, done better by a by a Highly, you know, an artificial intelligent robot, and the embarrassing answer is nine, ninety percent of the of the times you're you're having some trouble with a clerk or a reservations clerk or or uh, whatever it is, or uh, the job could be done more efficiently. That leads me to a question I'd like to ask you, Timothy, particularly with the emergence of the computer in the '80s and the technology that allows us to have this incredible abundance of information. Um, we have this paradox of this abundant information and informational sources, and we have this shortage of wisdom, yep. as you just pointed out in the fact that frequently we have human beings could perhaps their jobs could be better done by robots, mostly because uh, there isn't an appropriate application of wisdom mm -hmm. in the process of interacting with people. What about that paradox? Are computers going to give us wisdom? Yeah, uh, y you can... You could buy a probably within five years, three years, maybe two years. You'll be able to buy a wisdom 
programs like Pac-Man. It probably cost $35, $39. would <laughs> be the wisdom program, teach you how to be wise. And it would uh, stimulate you and uh, you could, you could uh, play games with it. And any time you slid off and started to be uh, unwise, the computer would say, oh, no, 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 come on now. You're supposed to be wise. Is, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, there is this paradox, but I think we must be very kind to each other. We are... We're involved in such an accelerated uh, rate of revolution right now, and things are happening so quickly. My goodness, every five years there's a, almost a new wave of um, of innovation that's happening. And uh, five years is more like five weeks. I, I agree. <laughs> it ate at the truth. I know. So that uh, now the problem is, of course, that the men, and I use the the male gender here quite uh, precisely, the the men who are running America go back. They're, they're the coal warriors. They're the hawks. They're the people who are imprinted. Uh, before 1946, they still believe in American Legion. They still believe in empire. They still believe in guns and uh, peace they, through strength. I think. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, they are still in charge and will remain in charge for the next two or perhaps six years. And uh, the last thing in the world they're interested in is an increase in intelligence or increase in wisdom. Uh, but uh, they'll be phasing out very quickly and. Uh, uh, I, I may be overly optimistic, but I believe that the younger generation, those be now be you know, born between 46 and 64, are going to uh, make a difference. They do think differently. And if I'm optimistic and if I'm wrong, I'm going to go around the country and I'm going to talk to several million people in the next uh, two or three years saying exactly this message. 76 million of you, you've got to be different. You, you, you simply uh, have, the, have the numerical power and I'm going to make it happen. If I have to go to <laughs> well, we're fond of saying around here that optimism is a biological necessity. Oh, boy, yeah. The word optimism is very interesting. It comes from the Latin op optimus, which means, you know, um, the best. And pes pessimist is the, uh, comes from the, the Latin word uh, pessimi, pessimist, uh, which means worst. And so uh, the, uh, we, we've simply got to demand uh, the best uh, from ourselves and from each other. Timothy, I'd be interested in your uh, perception of uh, what you see taking place now. It seems that we're living in uh, highly reactionary times, and it's almost... Uh, um, as if uh, there's this hell, uh, headlong rush to return to the past. Uh, there's a popularity of, of uh, nostalgia, and um, it should be like the 50s again. And What about that? What do you think is going on? Well, I think that in anything you say about uh, humanity at this point should precisely indicate the um, age group and the geographical location. Uh, it is true that um, in places like Washington, D.C., uh, there's a great deal of looking backward on the part of both the Republicans who want us to take, it, to take us back to a real glorious, wonderful war, uh, or the Democrats who want to somehow get back to the New Deal. And, and uh, there's... On the other hand... Uh, there's an enormous amount of, uh, of fresh, new, futuristic uh, thinking in this country. Uh, my travels have convinced me that, Michael, I think there are 20, maybe 30 million, maybe even more Americans who are reasonably enlightened. Now, they're not Buddhists, but they basically understand multiple reality. They basically have a sense of history. They have a sense of... Uh, they're basically tolerant. They basically um, understand what not to do. And they're waiting for uh, something uh, that will uh, harness... Uh, uh, maybe I'm concerned. Maybe... No, I think, well, SRI would agree with you. They've yeah. identified 21% uh, of the American population as being interdirected. Yeah, yeah. And 33 the million adults. Yeah, the Yan Yankovic poll, too, uh, suggested uh, that... Uh, as high as 80% were partially involved in lifestyle and mm -hmm. personal growth. But uh, the, the, um, the popularity of movies like E.T. and War Games, which are totally um, disrespectful of authority, and, and, and young people's movies just uh, irreverent uh, to the, the old ways. Uh, the computer movement, which um, the, the personal computer, the ability to have in your own home something that you can program and reprogram, means that uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, both of whom are, you know, acid heads or 60s kids, uh, have given us, uh, they wrenched away from the mainline IBM people, 
this powerful tool and made it available. In the old days, most of us hated computers because we were being spindled and mutilated and catalogued and pushed around by them, but that's no longer possible. Indeed, uh, even IBM, the, the great Vatican of, uh, of, com- of computeries, has given in now and is, is leading the way to uh, personal computers. This is important as a development of, uh, by Gutenberg of the printing press, which was a personal book before the Gutenberg. There was one mainframe book in any town owned by the cardinal or the duke. There was the Bible, and nobody could use it except uh, you know, the clerks or the hackers or the monks. So when Gutenberg allowed us to have the personal book, that meant we could, in a home, in our own home, we could read, and then we could start writing. We could start writing personal books and even recreational books. So the same thing was true with drugs in the 60s. The establishment had drugs, and then the idea of personal drugs and recreational drugs, that you could take it home and do what you wanted to. The computer is a, a continuation of this uh, evolutionary uh, uh, history, uh, something that uh, frees the individual to uh, to uh, program and reprogram and to uh, to get ahead of the system. So uh, I, I'm citing here many reasons of why I um, uh, I am optimistic. Although uh, I must agree that the Reagan administration is. Um, uh, represents a, a, an iron triangle of the military, uh, the Republican Party, and uh, the big industrial, particularly the weapons makers, who, who definitely run things, no question of it, the time, uh, life, and uh, Coca-Cola control Hollywood. They control the country. Uh, they even knocked out Ma Bell, wasn't it? We always thought Ma Bell owned this, but uh, turns out it's the uh, Lifetime and, Pepsi- and, and Coca-Cola. So I, I, I have no illusions about the, uh, I, I feel the men uh, in this Iron Triangle, the Republican Party, the military, and the weapons people are, they belong to the Puritan strain. Uh, it came over, you know, in the first wave of uh, from England. These men are tough-minded, they, they don't believe in life, they, they're predestinationists, they basically think that the world is a terrible place, and there is an elect, and you have to be a, you know, belong to that wasp, and they don't care about the country, they don't care about humanity, they don't believe in evolution, basically, and they're mean, nasty, they hate play, they hate fun, they hate the idea of individual, you know, freedom. Uh, no, I have no illusions, uh, I'm not just preaching marshmallow fluff here, and, you know, take a joint and, and everything's going to be great. I think we have to be incredibly smart, and we have to be incredibly effective in communicating. I'm communicating to more people, I think more effectively now than I was in the late 60s and 70s. I've got this book coming out. I, I think it's going to be a bestseller. God, the, 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 it's very clear the establishment hate my book. See, if, if, if Time, Magazine, Time Magazine wouldn't review my book, and they said they would, but they wouldn't. Now, that's really amazing. You see the stuff they review. And I finally understood why. They couldn't review that book because it's a good book about a good period, about a lot of good people doing a lot of good things. And if they were to say anything about that book, uh, you know, they, they want people to think that I'm brain damaged and I'm crazy and then my toasted head and uh, that, uh, blah, blah, blah. If they had to, to admit that the book was well written and it's about important events in human history, their whole edifice, their whole structure, their whole reality would, would have to change. And of course, they're not about to let that happen. So uh, I have no illusions about the uh, the power of the the men who are running things. And the Democrats, I, I'm giving hell to the Republicans here, but the Democrats are no help either. They're, they haven't come out with any new ideas. But uh, I, I think it's this collective intelligence that those who went through the 60s and 70s share uh, there's no easy answer, and I'm not here to. I'm not selling anything except uh, individual intelligence, uh, collectively shared, the ability to really look at each other in the eye, and, and we're not going to be fooled again, as uh, Peter Townsend sang. We're not going to follow leaders. We're going to watch our parking meters, as Dylan sang. Uh, there's a tremendous heritage of intelligence and a tremendous uh, confidence that we, that went through the '60s and '70s, share. And uh, when the time comes, uh, the, I don't think there's going to be a leader either. We're, we're beyond hierarchies and, and messiahs. Uh, it's not going to be a swami or a holy person. God help us. Uh, it's going to be networks. It's going to be uh, local groups. It's going to be communications. It's going to be computer linkages. It's going to be uh, the in- interfaces that a communication society can set up. It's going to be intelligence expressed and shared. And uh, we're going to see that our, our task is to uh, activate and stimulate each other to grow and change and uh, uh, it's going to require a lot of intelligence. It's not going to require work and struggle. It's not those old political notions. It's going to require sharp 
uh, sparkling eyed uh, uh, link up, and uh, I, I believe it's going to happen. So you think we're going to survive the uh, nuclear era where we have this incredible proliferation of nuclear weapons? you think we're going to come through it unscathed? Um, well, who knows? I, I don't know any more uh, than anyone else. Uh, I have my own scenario. Number one, I believe that you've got to, you've got to think positively and you've got to do everything in your power to... Um, to stop a nuclear. So I, I believe in nuclear activism. I believe in the freeze movement. I think that uh, we should all vote this year. Uh, I haven't voted in years. But I'm going to register and my wife Barbara and I are going to vote. We're encouraging young people to vote because, uh, God, 76 million of you, you, you got the power. Uh, yes, I, I'm basically realistically and scientifically optimistic. I think if we can hold on till 1988, the, the baby boom generation will elect uh, officers an administration who shall be realistic and will simply say to the rest, well, listen, we don't want to have the Cold War anymore. It's unrealistic to do that. And we'll do everything in our power to make the Soviet Union feel secure without, of course, disarming ourselves. We'll keep the concept of spaceship America or fortress America. I'll, I'll even buy that. But we're not we're going to pull back. We're not going to fight, fight you in Afghanistan. We're not going to surround you with all those... Uh, we're going to do everything in our power uh, realistically to make Russians feel secure. And we're going to tell the rest of the world we simply aren't going to go on with this insanity because the Cold War, the men that are running it, Reagan and Weinberger and uh, uh, Haig and Kissinger, you know, they are certifiably lunatic. They really have taken leave of their senses. They're out of touch with reality. They're playing out boys' locker room uh, games in their head that were, may have worked in, in, in World War II, but they're simply out of touch. And I think that... A positive, tough-minded, realistic administration of young Americans that say to the rest of the world, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to be patsies. We're not going to uh, uh, disarm. But uh, I think that would be such a refreshing voice. And I think the rest of the world waiting for America. Because most, you know, I've been around the world quite a bit uh, and I, I, since, I've, <laughs> since I got paroled uh, and uh, since I was able to leave the country, I've talked to a lot of... European and Asian and African journalists, and I uh, tell you, you ask them flat out, is there any hope from, from Europe or Asia or Africa? And they'll say, hell no. The only hope in the world is still America because it's the only place where freedom and intelligence and individualism and, uh, uh, and immigration, we invite the smart people to come here. It's the only place that's happening. It's not happening anyplace else. So, uh, yeah, these are my reasons for uh, optimism, but I'm an activist optimist and I'm out there uh, sending this signal out and uh, to as I say millions of people and that's why I wrote wrote this book I'm going to write other books I'm writing movies I'm very possible uh, transmitting a, a message of intelligent scientific uh, activist optimism boy that's a handful of uh, big words isn't it You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Well, as far as being able to forecast the political landscape here in the States, I'm afraid that poor Timothy was far too optimistic. And even today, with young Mr. Obama in the White House, we see that the political enlightenment Dr. Leary so optimistically predicted just hasn't come to pass. But that says more about the system than it does about the people who bubble to its top. However, politics aside, I think the rest of his forecasting was right on the money. I know that you are aware of this, but I have to say it. Wasn't his rap near the end just now uh, when he was going on about the future importance of personal computers and networking? Wasn't that amazing when you think of when he said it? That was back in 1983 when the IBM PC was just one year old and the web was still nine years away. When you go back and listen to it again, try to keep that in mind. And I think you'll agree that Dr. Timothy Leary, if nothing else, was surely a good prophet, or futurist in today's lingo. By the way, if you want another take on the stories surrounding Leary's departure from Harvard, you might want to listen to one of my interviews with Myron Stoloroff. I think it was in Podcast 92, uh, the last of the Lone Pine Stories programs, where he tells about being the person who actually broke the news about the imminent departure from Harvard to Leary's staff over dinner one night. 
It certainly puts another gloss on a tale that has as many facets as there were people involved. Also, in a couple of my interviews with Gary Fisher, he tells some interesting stories about his adventures with the good Dr. Leary and his merry little band as they were first kicked out of Mexico and then out of two Caribbean countries before winding up at Millbrook. And if you are interested in going back to one of those talks, uh, just go to our blog at psychedelicsalon.org and click on the Gary Fisher category or do a search for him and Dr. Leary. And, of course, uh, the same goes for finding other bits and pieces of these 180-plus podcasts that I've documented on that blog. Another interesting story about Dr. Leary can be heard on one of Douglas Rushkoff's recent radio programs. I might have missed this myself, but thankfully Ulysses S. sent me the information and a link to a conversation that Douglas had with counterculture heroine slash outcast Joanna Harcourt Smith on his radio show, The Media Squat. And I'll try to remember to put a link to it in the program notes for today's podcast. But what makes this interview so intriguing is that Joanna candidly talks about her and Leary's role in becoming informants for the government, all in the context of Timothy's imprisonment and the Bush-style torture of him during the time he was being held a captive in Afghanistan. As Douglas says... There's some new material in here, as well as a new perspective on a particularly dark moment. So, if, uh, like me, you are interested in these things, you might want to surf over to Douglas's website and take a listen. Another website I'd like to plug is that of the uber geek and graphic artist, Stephen Rook. Now, if you have a copy of my book, The Spirit of the Internet, you already have a copy of one of Stephen's works of art because I used it on the cover. I don't have time right now to go into the methodology involved in creating this art, but it's very intriguing. And for a little bit of tribal history, I might add that there was a magical night years ago when a hundred or so of us were in Palenque and Stephen projected images of his work through a 35mm slide projector and onto the naked bodies of dozens of dancers. It was a spectacular show and uh, one I hope to experience one day again. But if you do visit Stephen's website, be sure to uh, read about how he created this art, or more accurately, how an artificial intelligence did it. And while I'm in the plugging mood, I want to point you to a couple of podcasts that I haven't mentioned for a while, but which are two of my favorites. One is the return appearance of the musical programs from Queer Ninja over on the Cannabis Podcast Network at dopefiend.co.uk. I've listened to his uh, latest world music program at least three times now and plan on listening again. It's uh, really great to have you back in cyberdelic space, Ninja, uh, and thanks for getting back in the groove again. We, we all missed you. And then there is BB's Bungalow, which you will also find at dopefiend.co.uk. The other day I was cooking dinner, having a bag of vape, and listening to her 420 show, and I got to thinking about how nice it was to be able to enjoy sort of virtually hanging around her bungalow and listening to music and the conversation between her, SEB, and Queer Ninja. It really made me feel as if I wasn't uh, celebrating 420 alone. And uh, then, of course, I realized that it was already May, (laughs) and I was listening to her podcast a couple of weeks late. And so I had two 420 celebrations this year. Another thing I'd like to uh, point out about that particular program of BB's, I think it's number 20, is that it gave me the impression that SEB, the Ninja, and BB were all sitting in the same room and having a conversation, when the fact was that BB was in Australia and her two companions were quite literally on the other side of the world because they were both in the U.K., Now, even though we all seem to take things like this for granted today, just think back only, say, five years ago, and you'll remember that only big corporations with huge budgets could have pulled something like that off. Without paying much attention to it, our tech is rapidly changing the world. And I mean that quite literally. And you, my dear friend, are most definitely on the leading edge of this wave. So thanks for being a part of this continual unfolding of consciousness here in cyberdelic space. 
Finally, I'd like to pass along some news about the ongoing efforts to preserve as much of the historical record of our tribe as possible. To begin with, uh, fellow Saloner William Rafty has posted a six-part interview with the Shulgans on YouTube. This is a recent interview that took place in Ann and Sasha's home and is very much worth watching. So, hey, thanks for doing that, William. Uh, your work is very much appreciated. And the good news about the Shulgan and Stolaroff archives comes from John Hanna, who is one of the people deeply involved in these projects. We've exchanged a whole series of emails about this work when I asked him what they still needed in the way of resources to complete their project. And so, right now I'd like to read a few things he had to say. We don't have a minimum donation set up for the Stolaroff collection because we realize that any amount could really help with that project from a large number of folks. With the Shulgin collection, we did set a minimum donation. I think it was $500. And I am happy to say that enough money was raised to hire Paul to help Sasha working half-time for a year. So we are much less focused on raising money for that project at the moment and would prefer to plug funding for the Stolaroff collection work. And he goes on to say, I've already spent a bunch of time on the project on Arrowwood's dime without any real funding having come in yet for the work. Of course, they want to get it done, but unless we can generate some cash, the going will be quite slow. And then he sent me a URL where they've posted some information about this project, and I'll put that along with the program notes for uh, this podcast. But here is some of what you'll find there. In 1961, Myron Stolaroff founded the International Foundation for Advanced Study in Menlo Park, conducting clinical investigations administering carbogen, LSD, or mescaline to hundreds of subjects. In 1965, the FDA began to revoke permits for human studies with psychedelics, forcing the conclusion of this research. Between 1970 and 1986, Myron conducted additional personal studies using unscheduled compounds. However, this work was stopped too with the passage of the Controlled Substance Analog Act of 1986. Arrowwood has just begun the process of sorting and cataloging Myron's vast treasure trove of letters, writings, and ephemera related to his research into the effects of psychoactive drugs on human consciousness in order to prepare them for digitizing and publication online. But we need targeted funding to continue working on this archive, so please consider making a contribution to the Stolaroff Collection Project. We are seeking $10,000 to $15,000 for this project in 2009 to cover scanning and processing costs. Contributions made to support the Stolaroff Collection are earmarked for this project and are not used for the general support of Arrowwood. Donations are 100% tax-deductible in the United States. Now, if you've been with us here in the salon for a while, you have no doubt heard my interviews with Myron, as well as the talk he gave on the occasion of Albert Hoffman's 100th birthday celebration. Sadly, due to Myron's battle with dementia, there won't be any more interviews with this important figure in our tribe's history. And so it seems to me that it is more important than ever that we preserve as much of his work as possible. Now, I've personally gone through quite a bit of this material, and, and I'm here to tell you that it is simply priceless. Granted, the thousand or so highly detailed experience reports about dozens and dozens of compounds are something that researchers today will find priceless. But to me, it's the personal correspondence between the Stolaroff, Shulgans, and the other pioneers back in the day that future historians are going to find invaluable in filling out the personal details of the lives of these pioneers of consciousness research. And by the way, uh, John Hanna has already written one beautiful piece for the next issue of Arrowwood Extracts, which is uh, Arrowwood's membership magazine. And in it, he describes the recent trip that he took with Sasha and Ann Shulgin to visit the Stolaroffs and to collect the materials. Now, I understand that issue of extracts will be mailed out to the Arrowwood members in June. And the details of this trip he relates are really fascinating, along with some of the pictures he's included. As most of our fellow Saloners already know... This Arrowwood Extracts publication only comes out about twice a year, but I find it more than worth the $30 donation, 
which of course goes to keeping the Arrowwood site online. Now here are a few more thoughts from John Hanna who says, In any case, you might suggest that people donate whatever they can, but that donations of $25 or more will really help to get some hours clocked on the project. We also already have the first small fruit from the collection posted online, a few DMT trip reports from Al Hubbard circa 1961. And during May, those reports can be located from the Arrowhead homepage at arrowhead.org, that's E-R-O-W-I-D dot org, simply by clicking on the Arrowhead monthly link. Ultimately, it is going to take about $10,000 to complete the scanning aspect of archiving the Stolaroff collection. And while every donation of any amount helps, and a lot of small donations of $10 to $25 will add up, we can really get the project rolling if a few people gave somewhat larger donations. And by the way, uh, if you follow the link I put on the uh, program notes, you'll go to the page where the Stolaroff collection is uh, Posted, and you can make a donation, tax deductible donation, right there. Now, since this is a new call for help, and since we have received so many donations to the salon this past week, I feel like I should let all of our donors know that if you would like for me to send all or part of your donations to the salon on to the Stoleroff project, I'll be more than happy to do so. Uh, after all, we're all in this together, you know. But the real bottom line here is that. After spending the past several years working with Myron's family to try and preserve his records, that I am overjoyed at the progress that John and all of the other people involved in this project are making. And one day, a few centuries from now, my guess is that there will probably be more people reading through the papers of the Shulgans, Stoleroffs, and other psychedelic pioneers than there are people going through the records in any of the presidential libraries. This is really important work that the Arrowwood team has undertaken, and the fruits of their labors are going to be available on the Internet for all the world to share. So thanks in advance for whatever help you can give. And hey, I realize that most of our fellow saloners aren't in a position to help financially right now, but just by surfing over to arrowwood.org and looking through some of these interesting records lets us know that this work is not in vain. So... Don't feel bad if you can't send a few bucks their way. Just send some more people their way instead. It all helps. And now I guess it would help if I would just quit talking. So I'll close today's podcast by reminding you once again that this and all of the podcasts from the Psychedelic Salon are freely available for you to use in your own audio projects under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 License. And if you have any questions about that, just... Uh, Click the Creative Commons link at the bottom of uh, the Psychedelic Salon webpage, which you can find at psychedelicsalon.org. And uh, that's also where you'll find the program notes for these podcasts. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. On the back row and uh, of death row, and uh, Voltaire had the headed on the lamb. Uh, the long we were pretty much aware. Uh, I think all of us uh, at the Harvard Psychological Group, and, and that included about 35 of us, uh, people like Professor Walter Clark, who was a very distinguished, gray, ultra respectable uh, theologian. The younger uh, psychologists too. They knew they were risking their careers. They knew that they were uh, maybe going to put themselves out a little too far and never be able to get back, but uh, they, we had a we, we always had a sense of history. Allen Ginsberg, I, I have a chapter in flashbacks about Allen Ginsberg coming to Harvard, and Allen and uh, people like Kerouac and Burroughs taught us a great deal, too. They had the street wisdom that we lacked, uh, being Ivy League Harvard professors. And Allen Ginsberg, uh, whatever you think of his poetry, is a very effective... Um, literary social worker. He's like a, 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 a cosmic defense attorney for uh, beatniks and romantics and uh, bohemians and hippies and hipsters, no matter what name you give them. The 
the the group in every culture throughout history that have carried on the message of individuality, look within, irreverence to authority, question authority, uh, try something new. Ginsburg was uh, very aware. Ginsburg told me, and I, I've, I've thought about it almost every week since then, that uh, we were part of the of the Bohemian tradition or of the avant-garde tradition that. Uh, had always existed, and he, he felt that um, our group included Gary Snyder, it included uh, Ken Kesey. He saw us as, as, as important historically as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, and uh, we're a young country, and you, we've only been going 200 years, and I think when the history of our times is written, you're, you're never going to hear the names of Nixon or Kissinger or MacArthur, or, you know, the, you may make some mention of Roosevelt, maybe Kennedy because of the of the assassination of the romance, but the uh, Alan told us, and, and I believe him, and I'll repeat it today, that I think that the history of America is going to be the history of people like Emerson, uh, Thoreau, uh, Jefferson as a philosopher, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. My God, that poor man was, you know, was uh, savaged by the media. And uh... so, now that we found some of the others, uh, let's get to work here and get on with the program. At the end of today's podcast, I'll give you an update on the archival preservation work that is being done for the Shulgin and Stolaroff papers, and there is a lot of good news on that front. So, in the spirit of preserving archival material, I thought it might be appropriate once again to dip into the Timothy Leary archives and pull out another one of his pioneering talks. What I'm going to play for us to hear right now is an interview that Dr. Leary gave in 1983. And this is from a cassette tape in his archive that was labeled New Dimensions, featuring Tim Leary, recorded in 1983. And thanks to Bruce Damer and Dennis Berry, the woman who is responsible for this huge archive, all of the audio and video recordings that Timothy saved are being digitized and released to the Internet via the Internet Archive, which you can find at archive.org, and through these podcasts here in the Psychedelic Salon. Now, you're going to find this interview a little different in that it begins more like what our young saloners would call a history lesson and what grandpas like Robert O. and I think of uh, more as a stroll down memory lane. But I think that these stories are very important right now because we are entering another period of great instability, not unlike the 60s, I might add. And so if we know what some people did in the past at another time of great cultural upheaval, If we know what worked and what didn't work, well, then it seems to me that we have an excellent chance of ratcheting our species up yet another notch on our evolutionary climb out of the swamp. At least that's my rationale for indulging myself by playing what I think is a really interesting interview. And now, here is Dr. Timothy Leary back in 1983, when the Big news was that Lotus 123 had just been ported to the then-new IBM PC, and Ronald Reagan had just begun his horrible reign. And it was about 10 years before we had the World Wide Web. You remember those times, don't you? I I think they were called the Dark Ages. I'd like to enter a time machine, uh, if we will, uh, and go back 20 years, go back to Harvard. And uh, if you can put yourself back in that place, I'm wondering at that time, what was your vision of the future? What did you see? What you were doing then? Did you see it taking? Uh, where did you see it going? What was your future uh, idea of its direction? The work you were doing. I think that uh, from the very very beginning of our psychedelic drug research at Harvard, we knew that uh, we were on the verge of something very big. We knew that uh, human intelligence and human virtue had reached a point where uh, we would be able to uh, learn more about the brain and activate it. Um, uh, Of course, those of us at Harvard, uh, Richard Alpert, Baba Ramdas, Ralph Metzner, the the large group that assembled there, were not the pioneers, the, uh, the the people that were teaching us about consciousness, expanding drugs, were people like Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, even uh, Henry Luce, the respectable conservative uh, founder of Time magazine. There was a, a large group of uh, thoughtful people who 
told us that uh, the doors of perception were going to open and an avalanche of uh, change would happen. So we, there was never any doubt in our minds that uh, we, we were mem- members of a, of an old profession. And this happened before. It happened in the uh, 1830s. It was a transcendental movement, which again started at Harvard. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, the first great uh, uh, woman uh, transcendentalist. That explosive uh, movement in, of, of uh, Brook Farm, uh, but of course it goes way back. Uh, if you want to take the time tunnel, uh, the the concepts that we were working with, which is altered states, uh, consciousness expansion, increased intelligence, uh, finding divinity, and finding illumination, revelation within, it, it goes back uh, throughout human history. So we were, with the aid of people like Alan Watson and Aldous Huxley, we were we were pretty clear that we were uh, and certain that we were. Uh, riding a Niagara wave. Well, what happened with respect to the institution? Uh, in the sense, I mean, did you become too successful, and suddenly it wasn't appropriate to to be a part of the institution anymore, or did you? Or was it a, somehow somehow become threatening all of a sudden? What, what took place there when uh, Harvard essentially uh, asked you to leave and you departed? It it became clear to us that. Uh, the sort of research we were doing, which involved uh, radically different ways of approaching the brain and the mind, uh, couldn't and shouldn't be done in a prestigious, respectable, highly um, uh, establishment organization like Harvard University. So uh, actually, uh, several weeks before uh, Richard and I were fired, I had left Harvard. I turned in my... Uh, my uh, time clock and uh, had, had headed for uh, Mexico where we'd started uh, a training center. We knew that we shouldn't be at Harvard and we had no, uh, and never have had any uh, grudges about Harvard. Goodness, uh, Harvard is there to uh, train Ivy Leaguers to go to Washington and Wall Street and, <laughs> and keep the WASP establishment going. They're supposed to be turning out new Buddhas and <laughs> mm-hmm. a new brand of science fiction uh, neuronauts. <laughs> So it was just sort of a natural thing. Yes, we uh, there was a, uh, there was a little drama v- involved in it. Uh, as I in flashbacks, I mentioned some of the um, minor political squabbling. There was a a professor there named Herbert Kelman who kind of led an attack on us, and uh, turned out later that he was uh, a beneficiary of CIA funding. He says he wasn't winning, but that doesn't make any difference. The CIA knew they had a good, sound fellow there that uh, should be rewarded. So that uh, there were, but there were th- political issues, uh, but they're secondary. They're kind of uh, gossipy. But they're real. we didn't belong at Harvard, and uh, we uh, we set up our own institutions. That the, throughout history, that's been true. You know, Freud couldn't get uh, a job in a Viennese hospital, and. Uh, Socrates got uh, <laughs> put in the, for the last cell. Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And I have to tell you that as I was getting ready to record this podcast just now, I felt like maybe I was Rip Van Winkle or somebody just waking up from a long sleep and discovering that a lot of time has passed without me noticing. What I'm talking about is that for the past 10 days, I've more or less ignored the world while I'm in the final stages of recording my audio book. And when I poked my head back up and checked my email... I discovered that so many donors had made contributions to the salon that I was sure it must be December already and that it was Christmas time. Wait till you hear this list of donors. And they are... John A., our old friend, a dime short. Thanks again, Michael. Jason H., SMD Books, who uh, I notice happens to be located in Paris, so you Parisian saloners now know uh, where to find a few of the others. And we also received another donation from my fellow grandfather, Robert O. And uh, thank you again for your longtime support, Robert. 
And we also received three generous donations, one from Jarrett S., one from someone who would rather remain completely anonymous, so thank you, Anon. And the third one came from Wiley L., who is a longtime friend that I haven't seen since we were last together in Palenque. Wow, you guys have all really outdone yourselves this time. I simply don't know what to say. And I'd also like to thank Steve and Julie and you other wonderful Saloners for your cool cards and notes. I wish there was time to send out personal thank yous to everyone who sends in a donation or a card or email. But I do want you to know that everything any of our Saloners do to help spread the word about the psychedelic community is greatly appreciated by me and by all of our fellow psychonauts around the world. It's a wonderful community that we are all a part of.